Welcome to Something Came From Baltimore. I am your host, Tom Gauker. And if you are a working musician in the New York City area, you're working in the clubs, Broadway, or hopefully the Lincoln Center. And if you're based in L.A., you're working in TV and film. And that's where you're going to find our next guest on Something Came From Baltimore. Dan Rosenboom is a well-accomplished trumpet player who has worked with the, the best directors in the last decade. Star Trek Picard. Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, Jumanji, The Next Level, Frozen 2, The Secret Life's A Pet 2, and Creed 2 are just the tip of the iceberg of scores that Dan Rosenberg has worked on. In his solo work, you get this cool punk rock jazz recording called Points on the Infinity Line. Why is it punk rock? You're going to have to listen to the interview to find out. Before we get into it, let's listen to a sample of the track 2020. Dan Rosenblum, welcome to Something Came From Baltimore. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. Thank you very much. Hey, when I listen to this new album of your points on the Infinity Line, my first reaction that this is uh, like a punk rock jazz record. I feel it. it's a kind of a, a DIY in your face, an emotional assault, and I mean it in a good way. I, I did read your bio, and it felt that that's what was your intention for this album. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a kind of a perfect way of framing it, I think. The, the punk DIY aesthetic, you know, it's, it's not so much that it's punk in, the, in like, you know, the kinds of beats we're using or the kinds of instruments we're using or um, anything like that. It's just more that, you know, this was a garage project in the truest sense of the word. Over the last couple of years, I've set up my garage as a as a home recording studio. Back in January, you know, this band together featuring, you know, some of my close friends, uh, wonderful saxophonist Gavin Templeton, fantastic bassist named Billy Muller, and a uh, a spectacular young drummer named Anthony Fung. We got together in my garage and threw this whole thing down in three hours. And, uh, you know, all in the same room, no headphones, uh, just just listening to each other and playing. And uh, it was all mixed in the garage uh, by me and mastered by one of my best friends, a great bassist named Sam and I. And we put it out on, on uh, my DIY label called Arenda Records. You know, it, the, from the ground up, the whole project has just been about like capturing a vibe and a moment and a sort of raw energy that these players bring to the music, um, which I think you know, is what you're hearing. Yeah, I agree. It, it's like uh, when I say the punk rock year, I agree. It's it's an energy level that's created. And I I know that you mixed it yourself and I love the mix. I love the fact that you're, you're dead center and the, the drum really kind of never fades back and it's kind of uh, right there with you. I, I like that sound. Yeah, me too. I really like, you know, the instruments being really up close you know, not abrasive, but like, but really, you know, in your face so that, you know, you, you can really feel the kinetic energy that the musicians are playing with and, um, and where all the parts interact in a, in a, you know, really clearing and, and, um, dynamic way. And it feels like front row. You'd feel that energy level and you're like a front row seat. Oh, that's awesome. That's totally what we're going for. Now, just so that people realize that you live in L.A. and you're you're working constantly. If you're not creating your own music, you're involved in, in kind of like the whole musician for hire for soundtracks. And I just went through some of your titles, Despicable Me, Spider-Man 2, La La Land, Jumanji, uh, Deadpool 2, Frozen 2, and um, the... Five Bloods, which was a Terrence Blanchard recording for Spike Lee, the uh, Netflix show that just came out recently. I'm just skimming the, the surface. You are constantly working. I just like to talk about the Terrence Blanchard session just because I'm a real fan of him, and I know that he has a connection with, with Spike Lee. I wanted to review that album for Something Came From Baltimore, and I listened to it multiple times, and I felt it was 
in some ways, you know, soundtrack albums are awesome, but in this case, it felt very overwhelming. <laughs> and then when I listened to the it, with the movie, it made a lot more sense. Yeah, sure. I mean, that was a, a really fun session. You know, for for all those movies you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm playing in the trumpet section of the orchestra. It, it was really uh, cool to have Terrence Blanchard on the uh, on the podium directing his own music, and and you know, Spike Lee would come out and set up a scene for us and like give us a little bit of uh, explanation of you know what was what was going to be you know the emotional content of what we were going to play and just you know all of the you know kinds of sessions that you know are, are really fun because you're behind the scenes you're getting to be part of the creative process of stuff that you know millions of people are going to see you're also in the room with you know, some really unbelievable musicians who are all operating at the top of their game. And it's just, you know, it's, it's really a joy to be part of that stuff. The album, Points on the Infinite Line. It's not a title on your album. What does that mean to you? So Points on an Infinite Line is basically a reflection on, you know, what it is to be in the moment you know, in a in a conceptual way, in a musical way, both as a, a composer, a player, and as a human being. Um, I mean, if you think of time as kind of an infinite continuum, then every moment that we live, you know, is just a point on that line. And I feel the same way about composing and improvising. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people have different uh, thought processes, especially around um, composing, you know, but for me, it's always a snapshot of wherever my mind is at the time or wherever, you know, my feelings are at the time. And so in, in this album, you know, we're, I'm presenting basically eight sketches. They're in a way sort of, uh, how would I describe it? They're not incomplete, but, but just sort of launch pads for improvisation. And so when we were putting titles to the composition, points on an infinite line seemed to represent that uh, ethos of of not giving too much weight, but also there being a sort of profound uh, Zen connection to the to the now, to the to the current moment. I would say that the songs feel complete to me. I know that when you do say oh D- DIY, I know a lot of jazz artists. You know they they do quick recordings, and it, it's a mm-hmm. it's a live snapshot. But it's the the you know historically you know people a jazz artist knock out an album in a day and the, the fact that you guys it's all about the grooving how you guys groove together i don't mean i don't mean any of that to sound diminutive i just mean that that you know like w- when i wrote them i wrote the tunes uh basically just head to paper without playing them or listening to them um uh and one right after the other um and the first time i heard them was when the band got together to rehearse and um, and it was kind of an experiment for myself to see like what would happen if I, you know, wrote things in that way without any kind of editorial process. And I said, I'm really happy with how how they all came out. I think it was it was cool. And like you said, like what I think uh, is really wonderful about you know jazz and Black American music as a tradition is is how in a lot of cases it sets the stage for um, for interplay and democratic contribution by the whole band. I mean, everybody gets a say, everybody gets to contribute their own creativity. And so, you know, while the composer might present the idea to, to start with, then all the players make it their own and, uh, you know, add that to it and expand upon it. Um, and it becomes this really shared kind of experience. That to me is what, what I, I really value about doing music like this. Yeah, it's a success. Let's talk about some of the tracks on the album. Uh, Momentum is the sure. the first song. It has a weird start to me, and then it it kind of sets the tone of kind of what we're going to expect. Sure. 
that intro that you're talking about, I was I was thinking about Don Cherry a little bit. He's he's always been sort of a, a guiding light in my own, but without making it like too overt a nod, I just kind of wanted to set the mood with this like meditative, you know, uh, sort of spacey tones, and then uh, then it you know kind of launches into this this sort of inexorable march that's propelled by Billy Moeller's bass line and. Um, and Anthony Fung's drums, um, and the, and none of the tunes on the album had titles until after we recorded them. Um, they were all just numbered. The the feeling that I got from this piece was that it was this sort of like continuously marching forward, you know, uh, driving, but not like slow burn kind of drive. Um, and it felt like you know momentum was was it was setting up the momentum for the music in the in the rest of the album but also when we were coming up with the titles it was right around the time uh that the protests were kicking off in the the uh the summer and um when uh you know it it started to feel like maybe we have some real momentum in this moment to uh to create some real social change and um I still feel optimistic uh, on those terms, you know, even though you know we see a lot of turbulent news all the time. Um, second song on the album is called A Force of Good, and this is where I, I paused and I had a visual of uh, the movie Birdman. Uh, it's the uh, 2014 uh, Michael Keaton movie, and if, oh, yeah. Yeah, if you remember that movie, the, the music to me felt like an additional character, and Absolutely. Yeah. I loved that movie and that soundtrack. I, I really thought Antonio Sanchez should hold the Oscar for that. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah. The things I love about that tune in particular is exactly that, that sort of like fierce drive that's coming from the rhythm section. Um, one funny sort of anecdote about the piece is the melody is actually written in three. I originally wrote it almost as like a jazz waltz. And on one of the shows that we did before recording the record, in the open improv section, uh, the rhythm section got into that fast driving four that you hear. And um, and I love that groove and that beat. Um, and, and so I, I figured, well, why not make that the foundation of the song and then just still have the melody float over the time and uh, still being in three. And, and so it has this cool, you know, polyrhythmic, but also like free floating aspect to the horns where the rhythm section is just like, you know, just totally laying it down and, and, um, and grooving hard and the, and the horns are really kind of floating on top of it. And we wanted that. The, the experience of that tune on the record to just be kind of an all-out guns blazing, you know, flow. Um, and so I, I think it came off really cool. And, um, and uh, uh, the the title for that tune again, you know, came after the recording. And I and I felt like that drive and spirit and and rousing quality in the music uh, reminded me of the John Coltrane quote: "I want to be a force for good." I was thinking about how music can uplift people and, and how it can provide inspiration and excitement and make you feel motivated and make you feel, you know, um, engaged. And and, uh, and ultimately, my goal as a performer is to embrace that um, idea of being a force for good uh, 
through music, you know, helping all of us kind of restock the plane together and experience more connection and more shared consciousness and love for each other, uh, you know, through the experience of sharing music. I really love Come Humble because I felt that there was a DC Go Go beat. I'm, you know, obviously from Baltimore. <laughs> what was that about? And I, I love that it's in there. It's a little surprise. I think that was, you know, I got to give the credit to that, uh, to Anthony Fung. Um, one of the things we, we decided to do after the session was have him come back over and bring over some extra percussion and just add some layers to a few things. And, and that was one of the things that, uh, that he wanted to do with that tune, you know, it, given the way the bass line is and, and the backbeat that underlies the whole thing. Um, he had the idea to use this Panamanian drum, uh, that's kind of like a conga. I forget exactly the name of it, um, but he he uh, played that uh, and then added the clave. And he was like, he was like, yeah, man, it'll be like a go-go beat. And he kept referring to, uh, he kept saying, Billy's gonna love it. I mean, Billy, the uh, bass player on on the record. Uh, and uh, I think I think it was, it's such a cool vibe, you know, because that tune. The whole idea of that tune was not for it to necessarily be like a big dynamic swell or anything, but to just be like this sort of riding vibe and to have that that sort of underpinning go-go beat in there just makes me smile. everyone like a really great solo mm -hmm. yeah one of the things i always try to do with my music is leave a lot of space for uh unscripted open improvisation you know um so uh i feel like that gives everyone a chance to be in their sort of like maximum creative capacity um and uh you know that's what i that's what i want in in my music because i want all the musicians to feel a sense of equal ownership over the trajectory of a song. So uh, in that particular tune, one of the things I love is sort of how it breaks down into solos and duos within the group. So it's, I mean, it's only a quartet, but you've got like four or five different sounds or group sounds going on throughout the, the, the piece. You've got the full band and then it breaks down to just drums and then there's just trumpet and drums and then it fades into like a, saxophone and bass duo and then um it comes back around with some hits from the trumpet and drums and then like you know some drums and bass and saxophone and then finally the full group again and i love that kind of um that uh sort of meandering but also like really convicted um uh, expression from from the group as a whole
I want people to check you out. And I noticed that uh, you're really like you have a lot of recordings uh, available on your website. Uh, your website is so professional and your YouTube uh, very light on content, but also extremely uh, professional. I guess okay. you have a, a less is more attitude. How do they navigate connecting with you? The two main places are my website, as you mentioned, which is, which is danrosenboom.com, and the DIY label that I started called Orenda Records, uh, which is just orendarecords.com. And uh, one of the great things on Orenda is, is we've got over 80 albums of all um, really interesting artists. I think there's there's something like uh, uh, almost 30 artists now, maybe. But um, but uh, everybody's doing super interesting work, and it's not all available on Spotify or YouTube because I leave it up to the musicians um, you know, as to as to where they want their music to appear. Uh, I also want to make sure that they retain the rights to all their music and they get as much of the income from the music as possible. It's really artist forward. And I kind of take the same approach with some of my stuff. So not everything is on Spotify or YouTube. Um, I try to, on YouTube, you know, as far as the video goes, I try to keep it to just the stuff that I feel meets a certain standard, you know, rather than just putting every gig up there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, everything's up on the website, um, danrosenboom.com. There's, there's lots of recordings there. There's videos. There's, um, there's, uh, I actually put out a trumpet method book, um, that's up there. And I have a, a Patreon page, uh, where I do some educational stuff for not just trumpet players, but production stuff and composition as well. And, um, but yeah, I, I'm, I've been thinking about it, especially during COVID about, you know, how to kind of, distill, you know, where people get the the information from. And I think, you know, the website, danrosenboom.com, is the, is the best place to go, for sure. Thank you very much, Dan Rosenboom, for speaking to me on Something Came From Baltimore. The album's called Points on the Infinite Line. I'm a fan of this album, and I am glad that I spoke to you today. I think it's, uh, I, th I want everyone to check this album out. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It was a real pleasure being on, and I really appreciate the support. Hi, it's Tom Gowker, and I am the host of Something Came From Baltimore. Something Came From Baltimore is a words and music podcast, and it has famous and future famous artists. Artists like Sean Jones, Rupert Holmes, Auntie Hammy, Joey DeFrancesco, Go Go Penguin, Joey Alexander, Bucanti, Gerald Albright, Paula Cole, and Kat Edmondson. It's music that matters. It's music for your ears. Listen and subscribe to Something Came From Baltimore and be a part of that Be More music scene.